The Blade Itself, from the First Law Series, by Joe Abercrombie, read by Stephen Pacey. He started running. His feet thumped on the stone. The air whistled in his mouth, plucked at his torn clothes. The flat roof came flying up towards him. He landed with a shuddering impact, rolled once, just as Pharaoh had done, stood up beside her. He was still alive. Ha! Ah, he shouted. What do you think of that? There was a creaking sound, then a cracking, then the roof gave way under Logan's feet. He grabbed despairingly at Pharaoh as he fell, and she slid through after him, helpless. He tumbled in the air for a sickening moment, wailing, hands clutching at nothing. He crashed down on his back. Logan coughed on choking dust, shook his head, shifted painfully. He was in a room, inky dark after the brightness outside. Dust was filtering down through the light from the ragged hole in the roof above. There was something soft under him. A bed. It had half collapsed, leaning at an angle, blankets covered in broken plaster. There was something across his legs. Pharaoh. He snorted a gurgling laugh to himself. In bed with a woman again at last. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite what he'd been hoping for. Stupid fucking pink! She snarled, scrabbling off him and over to the door, bits of wood and plaster sliding off her dusty back. She hauled on the doorknob. Locked! It's— Logan crashed past her, ripping the door off its hinges and sprawling out into the corridor beyond. Pharaoh sprang over him. Up, Pink, up! A handy-looking length of wood had split from the edge of the door, a couple of nails sticking out of the end. Logan snatched it up in his hand. He struggled to his feet, stumbled down the corridor a few paces, came to a junction. A shadowy hallway stretched away to either side. Small windows cast sharp pools of light on the dark matting. No way to tell which way Pharaoh had gone. He turned right towards a flight of stairs. There was a figure moving carefully down the dim corridor towards him, long and thin like a black spider in the darkness balanced on the balls of its feet. A chink of light shone on bright red hair. You again, said Logan, weighing the length of wood in his hand. That's right, me. There was a jingling sound, a flash of metal in the dark. Logan felt the piece of wood ripped out of his fingers, and he saw it fly over the woman's shoulder and clatter away down the corridor. Unarmed again, but she didn't give him long to worry about it. There was something in her hand, something like a knife, and she threw it at him. He ducked out of the way, and it hissed past his ear. Then she jerked her other arm, and something slashed him across the face, just under his eye. He lurched back against the wall, trying to understand what kind of magic he was facing. It was like a metal cross, the thing in her hand. Three curved blades, one with a hook on the end. A chain looped from a ring on the handle and disappeared up her sleeve. The knife thing darted out, missed Logan's face by an inch as he bobbed away, struck a shower of sparks as it ripped back along the wall and slapped smoothly back into her hand. She let it drop, swinging gently from its chain, rattling against the floor, jumping and dancing towards him as she edged forward. She jerked her wrist and the thing shot out at Logan again, slashed across his chest as he tried to get away, spattering drops of blood against the wall. He dived at her, but his outspread arms caught nothing. There was a rattle, and he felt his foot dragged from under him, his ankles snapped round painfully, caught by the chain as she ducked by. He sprawled out on his face, started to push himself up. The chain snaked under his neck. he just got his hand behind it before it snapped taut. The woman was on top of him. He could feel her knee pressing into his back, could hear her breath hissing through her mask as she pulled, the chain growing tighter and tighter, cutting into the palm of his hand. Logan grunted, scrabbling to his knees, lumbering unsteadily to his feet. The woman was still on his back, all her weight bearing down on him, pulling up the chain as hard as she could. 
Logan flailed around with his free hand, but he couldn't get at her, couldn't throw her off. She was like a barnacle stuck fast to him. He could hardly breathe now. He tottered forward a few steps, then dropped over backwards. Ah! whispered the woman in his ear as his weight crushed her into the floor. The chain went slack enough for Logan to drag it clear and slither out from under it. Free. He rolled over and grabbed the woman's neck with his left hand, started squeezing. She kneed at him, dug at him with her fists, but his weight was across her and the blows were weak. They snarled and gasped and croaked at each other, animal sounds, faces only inches apart. A couple of spots of blood dripped from the cut on his cheek and patted on her mask. Her hand came up and started fumbling with his face, pushing his head back. Her finger forced its way up his nose. Ah! He screamed. Pain stabbed up into his head. He let go of her and staggered up, one hand clasped to his face. She scrambled away, coughing, landed a kick in his ribs that bent him over, but he still had a grip on the chain and he yanked on it with all his weight. Her arm snapped out and she yelped and flew straight into him, his knees sinking into her side, crushing the breath out of her. Logan grabbed hold of the back of her shirt, half lifted her off the floor, and flung her down the stairs. She rolled and flopped and bounced her way down, slid to a stop on her side near the bottom. Logan was half tempted to follow her down and finish the job, but he had no time. There'd be more where she came from. He turned and hobbled back the other way, cursing his twisted ankle. Sounds crept up on him from all around, echoing down the corridor from who knew where. Distant rattling and banging, shouts and cries. He stared into darkness, limping, running with sweat, one hand on the wall to steady himself. He leaned round a corner, trying to see if it was clear. He felt something cold across his neck. A knife. Still alive? whispered a voice in his ear. You don't die easy, eh, Pink? Pharaoh. He slowly pushed her arm away. Where'd you get the knife? He wished he had one. He gave it me. There was a crumpled shape in the shadows by the wall, the matting all round soaked with dark blood. This way. Pharaoh crept off down the corridor, keeping low in the darkness. He could still hear the sounds beneath them, beside them, all around them. They crept down a flight of stairs, out into a dim hallway panelled with dark wood. Pharaoh ducked from shadow to shadow, moving fast. Logan could do no more than limp after her, dragging his leg, trying not to squeal with pain whenever he put his weight on it. There! It's them! Figures in the dim corridor behind. He turned to run, but Pharaoh held her arm out. There were more coming the other way. There was a big door on his left, standing open a crack. In here. Logan shoved his way through, and Pharaoh darted in after him. There was a heavy piece of furniture beside it, a big cupboard thing with shelves on top covered in plates. Logan grabbed hold of one end and dragged it across in front of the doors, a couple of the plates dropping off and smashing on the floor. He pressed his back against it. That should hold them for a moment, at least. A big room with a high vaulted ceiling. Two huge windows took up most of one wood-panelled wall, a big stone fireplace facing them. A long table stood between, ten chairs on either side, set for eating with cutlery and candlesticks. A big dining room, and there was only one way in. Or out. Logan heard muffled shouting beyond the door. The big cupboard wobbled against his back. Another plate clattered from its shelf, bounced off his shoulder, and smashed on the stone flags, scattering fragments across the floor. Nice fucking plan, snarled Pharaoh. Logan's feet slid as he strained to hold the teetering cupboard up. She dashed over to the nearest window, fumbled at the metal frames round the little panes, prizing with her fingernails, but there was no way out. Logan's eye caught on something. An old great sword mounted over the fireplace as an ornament. A weapon. He gave the cupboard one last shove, then hurried over to it, seized hold of the long hilt in both hands, and ripped it from its bracket. It was blunt as a plough, the heavy blade spotted with rust, but still solid. 
A blow from it might not cut a man in half, but it would knock him down all right. He turned just in time to see the cupboard tipping over, dropping shattering crockery all over the stone floor. Black figures spilled into the room, masked figures. The one at the front had an evil-looking axe, the next a short-bladed sword. The one behind him was dark-skinned with gold rings through his ears. He had a long curved dagger in either hand. Those weapons were not for knocking a man on the head with, not unless they meant to knock his brains right out. Seemed that they'd given up on taking prisoners. Killing weapons, meant to kill. Well, so much the better, Logan told himself. If you say one thing for Logan Ninefingers, and one thing only, say he's a killer. He eyed those black-masked men clambering over the fallen cupboard, spreading out cautiously around the far wall. He glanced over at Pharaoh, lips curled back, knife in her hand, yellow eyes sparkling. He fingered the grip of his stolen sword, heavy and brutal. Just the tool for the job, for once. He plunged at the nearest mask, yelling at the top of his voice, swinging the sword over his head. The man tried to duck away, but the tip of the blade caught him on the shoulder and knocked him reeling. Another one jumped in behind him, chopping with his axe, sending Logan stumbling away, gasping as his weight went onto his bad ankle. He flailed around with the big sword, but there were too many. One scrambled over the table, got between him and Pharaoh. Something hit him in the back, and he stumbled, spun, slipped, lashed out with the sword, and hit something soft. Somebody screamed, but by then the one with the axe was coming for him again. Everything was a mess of masks and iron, clashing, scraping weapons, curses and cries, ragged breathing. Logan swung the sword, but he was so tired, so hurt, so aching. The sword was heavy and getting heavier all the time. The mask weaved out of the way, and the rusty blade clanged into the wall, knocking a great chunk out of the wooden panelling and biting into the plaster behind, the shock nearly jarring it out of his hands. Oof! he breathed as the man kneed him in the stomach. Something hit him in the leg, and he nearly fell. He could hear somebody yelling behind, but it seemed far away. His chest was hurting, his mouth was sour, there was blood on him, all over him. He could hardly breathe. The mask stepped forward, and again, smiling, smelling victory. Logan lurched back towards the fireplace, his foot slipping, falling down on one knee. All things come to an end. He couldn't lift the old sword any more. There was no strength left, nothing. The room was growing blurry. All things come to an end, but some only lie still, forgotten. There was a cold feeling in Logan's stomach, a feeling he hadn't felt for a long time. No, he whispered. I'm free of you. But it was too late. Too late. There was blood on him, but that was good. There was always blood, but he was kneeling, and that was wrong. The bloody nine kneels to no man. His fingers sought out the cracks between the stones of the fireplace, prizing between them like old tree roots, pulling him up. His leg hurt, and he smiled. Pain was the fuel that made the fires burn. Something moved in front of him, masked men, enemies. Corpses, then. You're hurt, Northman! The eyes of the closest one sparkled above his mask, the shining blade of his axe danced in the air. Want to give up yet? Hurt? The bloody nine threw back his head and laughed. I'll fucking show you, hurt! He tumbled forward, flowed beneath the axe, slippery as fishes in the river, swinging the heavy blade in a great low circle. It crunched into the man's knee and cracked it back the wrong way, scythed on into his other leg and ripped it out from under him. He gave a muffled scream as he spun onto the stones, turning round and round in the air, shattered legs flopping. Something dug into the bloody nine's back, but there was no pain. It was a sign, a message in a secret tongue that only he could understand. It told him where the next dead man was standing.
He reeled around, and the sword followed him in a furious, beautiful, irresistible arc. It crunched into someone's guts, folded him in half, snatched him off his feet, and flung him through the air. He bounced from the wall beside the fireplace and crumpled on the floor in a shower of broken plaster. A knife whirled, hissing, stuck deep into the bloody nine's shoulder with a damp thud. The black one, with the rings through his ears. He had thrown it. He was on the other side of the table, smiling, pleased with his throw. A terrible mistake. The bloody nine came for him. Another knife flashed past, clattered against the wall. He sprang over the table, and the sword followed behind. The dark man dodged the first great swing, and the second. Fast and tricky clever, but not clever enough. The third blow bit him in the side. A glancing bite, just a nibble. It only smashed his ribs and knocked him screaming to his knees. The last one was better. A circle of flesh and iron that carved into his mouth and ripped his head half off, showering blood across the walls. The bloody nine plucked the knife from his shoulder and tossed it to the floor. Blood ran from the wound, soaked through his shirt, and made a great, lovely, warm red stain. He dropped and faded away, leaves falling from the tree, rolling across the ground. A man lunged past, slashing at the air where he had stood with a short-bladed sword. Before he could turn, the bloody nine was on him, left hand snaking round his fists. He struggled and strained, but it was useless. The bloody nine's grip was strong as the roots of mountains, relentless as the tide. They send such as you to fight me? He flung the man back against the wall and squeezed, crushing his hands around the grip of his weapon, turning the short blade until it was pointing at his chest. A fucking insult! He roared, spitting him on his own sword. The man screamed and screamed behind his mask, and the bloody nine laughed and twisted the blade. Logan might have pitied him, but Logan was far away, and the bloody nine had no more pity in him than the winter, less even. He stabbed and cut and cut and smiled, and the screams bubbled and died, and he let the corpse drop to the cold stones. His fingers were slick with blood, and he wiped it on his clothes, on his arms, on his face, just as it should be. The one by the fireplace was sitting, hanging limp, head back, eyes like wet stones staring at the ceiling. Part of the earth now. The bloody nine smashed his face open with the sword, just to make sure. Best to leave no doubts. The one who'd had the axe was crawling for the door, legs twisted out and dragging over the stones behind him, gasping and whimpering all the way. Quiet now. The heavy blade crunched into the back of the man's skull and sprayed his blood across the stones. More, he whispered, and the room turned around him as he sought out the next kill. More! He bellowed, and he laughed, and the walls laughed, and the corpses laughed with him. Where's the rest of you? He saw a dark-skinned woman with a bleeding cut on her face and a knife in her hand. She didn't look like the others, but she would do just as well. He smiled, crept forward, raising the sword in both hands. She stepped away, watching him, keeping the table between them, hard yellow eyes like the wolf. A tiny voice seemed to tell him that she was on his side. Shame. Northerner, eh? asked a massive shape in the doorway. Aye. Who's asking? The stone splitter. He was big, this one. Very big. And tough. And savage. You could see it on him as he shoved the cupboard away with his huge boot and crunched forward through the broken plates. It meant less than nothing to the bloody nine, though. He was made to break such men. Tulduru Thunderhead had been bigger. Rudd Three Trees had been tougher. Black Dow had been twice as savage. The bloody nine had broken them and plenty more besides. The bigger, the tougher, the more savage he was, so much the worse would be his breaking.
Stone shitter, laughed the bloody nine. So fucking what? Next to die is what you are, and nothing more. He held his left hand up, spattered with red blood, three fingers spread out wide, grinning through the gap where the middle one used to be a long time ago. They call me the Bloody Nine. <laughs> the stone splitter ripped off his mask and threw it on the floor. Liar! There's plenty of men on the north have lost a finger. They ain't all nine fingers. No, only me. That great face twisted up with rage. Ye fucking liar! Ye think to scare the stone splitter with a name that's not your own? I'll carve a new ass in you, maggot! I'll put the bloody cross on you! I'll put you back in the mud, you coward fucking liar! Kill me? The bloody nine laughed louder than ever. I do the killing, fool! The talk was done. Stone Splitter came at him with axe in one hand and mace in the other, great heavy weapons, though he used them quick enough. The mace swung across, smashed a great hole through the glass in one of the windows. The axe came down, split one timber of the table in half, made the plates jump in the air, the candlesticks topple. The bloody nine twitched away, frog-hopping, waiting for his time. The mace missed his shoulder by an inch as he rolled across the table, cracked one of the big flat stones on the floor, split it down the middle, chips flying through the air. Stone Splitter roared, swinging his weapons, smashing a chair in half, knocking a chunk of stone out of the fireplace, chopping a great gash in the wall. His axe stuck fast in the wood for a moment, and the Bloody Nine sword flashed over, broke the haft into splintered halves, leaving the Stone Splitter with a broken stick in his paw. He flung it away and hefted the mace, came on even harder, swinging it round with furious bellows. It sailed over, and the Bloody Nine sword caught it just below the head, ripped it out of the big hand. It twisted through the air and clattered into the corner, but the stone splitter pressed forward, spreading his great hands out wide. Too close to use the big sword now. Stone splitter smiled as his huge arms closed around the Bloody Nine, folding him tight, holding him fast. Gaia! he shouted, squeezing him in a great hug. An awful mistake. Better to embrace the burning fire. Crack! The Bloody Nine's forehead smashed into his mouth. He felt the stone splitter's grip slacken a little, and he wriggled his shoulders, making room, wriggling, wriggling, mole in his burrow. He swung his head back as far as it would go. Billy Goat charges! The second headbutt smashed the stone splitter's flat nose open. He grunted, and the big arms released a little more. The third cracked his cheekbone. The arms fell away. The fourth broke his heavy jaw. Now it was the bloody nine holding him up, smiling as he mashed his forehead into the shattered face. Woodpecker pecking. Tap, tap, tap. Five, six, seven, eight. There was a satisfying rhythm to the crunching of the face bones. Nine, and he let the stone splitter fall. He sagged sideways and crumpled onto the floor, blood spilling from his ruined face. How's that for ya? laughed the bloody nine, wiping blood out of his eyes and giving the stone splitter's lifeless body a couple of kicks. The room spun around him, swam around him, laughing, laughing. How's that? <sighs> Fuck. He stumbled, blinked, sleepy, campfire guttering. No, not yet. He dropped to his knees. Not yet. There was more to do. Always more. Not yet. He snarled, but his time was up.